the altars where you meet us Take me there, take me there If what you need is just an offering It's right here, my life is here Yes, I'll be your living Sacrifice for you You're a fire, the refiner I want to be consumed want to be tried by fire Purify, take whatever Lord, here's my life Yes, if your glory wants to come in Let it fall We want it all The fire is consuming Feel this place Set it in place I'll be a living Hallelujah Sacrifice you, you are a fire, the refiner. I want to be consumed. I want to be tried by fire. You refine, you take whatever you desire. Lord, here's my life. I want to be tried. My fire, you refine, you take whatever you desire. Lord, here's my life. Lord, here's my life. You want it some more. Here's my life. You died for it, so Lord, here's my life. You gave yours, so I give mine. You gave yours, so I give mine. Lord, here's my life. You gave yours, so I give mine. You gave yours, so I give mine. Freely you gave, so freely I give. You gave yours, so give mine. Lord, here's my life. Hold me, my hands. Please purify my heart. Sacrifice. I want to burn for you, Ooh. only for you. Oh, my hands, you refine my heart. I want to burn for you, Hallelujah. Only. Me 
not my plan Just you did it all in Your will, not my will Just like you Father, thank you for allowing us to see another day. Thank you for another privilege and opportunity to come together as like-minded people and dive into your word. Holy Spirit, have your way in this place and the places of wherever your people are. Think in my mind, speak through my lips that your word may go forth with poverty, with power, clarity, and revelation. That it may minister hope to your people, inspiration to your people, that they may be transformed, never to be the same. And everything we do and ask, we'll give you all the glory in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. So turn with me to Matthew chapter 6. Matthew chapter 6 again. We're going to go back to verse 7. So last week we talked about prayer. And we're going to continue with that. So Matthew chapter 6, it says, I'm reading from the Passion Translation because I like the, the wording in this translation. It says, when you pray, there is no need to repeat empty phrases praying like the Gentiles do. For they expect God to hear them because of their many words. There is no need to imitate them since your father already knows what you need before you ask him. Pray like this. Our father, our beloved father dwelling in the heavenly realms, may the glory of your name be the center on which our lives turn. Manifest your kingdom realm and cause your every purpose to be fulfilled on earth just as it is in heaven. We acknowledge you as our provider of all we need each day. Forgive us the wrongs we have done as we ourselves release forgiveness to those who have wronged us. Rescue us from every time. Rescue us every time we face tribulation and set us free from evil. For you are the king who rules with power and glory forever. Amen. So for the next few moments, I want to talk to you from the subject, 
the ABCs of prayer. The ABCs of prayer. So last week we um we determined that prayer is simply a solemn request that is filled with admiration for help addressed to God. I'm going to say that again. Prayer is a solemn request that is filled with admiration for help addressed to God. One of the most powerful prayers come from a place of humility, not sophistication, not popularity, not pride, simply from a place of Humility. You can think of it like this. The lower you are when you pray, the higher your prayers go. The lower you are when you pray, the further your prayers can reach. Last week we talked about position and how when you're in the right position, when you move forward, there's more power behind your move. So when you're in the right position, when you're low enough when you pray, your prayers have more power. There's more thrust to go. And, and if you look back in the first four verses of Matthew, it talks about examining yourself, examining your motives. And yes, I know in that in those verses, it's talking about you examine yourself while you're giving. You're not giving to be seen by others, but you're giving simply for the act of giving. And knowing that everything you do in secret, your father, will, um, he will bless you openly. But isn't it funny? There's a reason that that he talks about examining yourself and then he follows it up with talking about prayer. Why? Because when you pray, it's not about the mind. It's about the heart. So whenever you pray even before you pray, you should examine yourself. And we'll get into that a little more later, as that is one of the one of the parts in the Lord's Prayer, is examining yourself. Gandhi put it like this. Gandhi said, It is better in prayer to have a heart without words than words without a heart. It is better in prayer to have a heart without words than words without heart. You know, yes, we put a, 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 a strong and high value on words, but sometimes the most the most thought about, the most complex of words can can destroy the simplicity of a moment. Words are not always necessary I said it last week if you can go and pray without any words why because the father knows your heart it's not always it's not about the words it's about the heart your mind can overthink everything you're saying but when your heart is coming from a place of humility and, and genuineness then you can rest assured that the Lord hears you. All right. I know we, we always say prayer, you know, people, when, we, when we're teaching our children what prayer is and how to pray and things, you know, a lot of times we'll just simply say, yeah, prayer is simply talking to God. Prayer is simply having a conversation with God. I'm going to go on record and say this. Prayer is not always a conversation. Write that down. Prayer is not always a conversation. Right? So, to go further, let's define conversation. A conversation is when two or more people are engaging together. When there is an exchange of words. Right? But... That's a lot of times that's where we go wrong in prayer because it's all we're always trying to have that conversation with God. But a lot of times it's not 
so much about a conversation. It's it will start off as a conversation, but it will end as a monologue because a lot of the times God isn't looking for us to come in and and talk with him, but he's looking for us to come in and commune with him. And in that communion, that communing with him, he's going to speak to us. And watch this. When you allow yourself to be still and listen in prayer, prayer will become the place that helps prepare you for the future. I know we hear the stories all the time about how when people are in the morning, they go before the Father and they're praying and, and God's talking to them and and he's initially keeping them from something that might possibly happen in the future that could be detrimental to them. You know, oh, the Holy Spirit told me he, he kept me a little longer in prayer and him keeping me in prayer and speaking to me a little longer kept me from that car accident. You know, him speaking to me a little longer and keeping me a little longer kept me from, from getting that, that ticket. Because a lot of times when you, you know when you're when you're letting God speak to you, because he is the Prince of Peace, he's speaking peace to you. So therefore you know you're in no rush in the morning. So whether you're truly late or not, you're in no rush because you're you're covered with peace. So prayer is not always a conversation. So the ABCs of prayer. The ABCs of prayer. So let's go back again and read the Lord's Prayer one more time. It says, pray like this. Our beloved Father. Let's stop right there because last week we talked about one of the things that that weakens our prayers is our position. When we don't know our position, and right off the bat, He's letting you know His. He's letting you know what your position is by what you refer to Him as. He says, "Our beloved Father." Only way you call it somebody Father. Is if you are a son. So he's letting you know off the bat. Your position is a son. You are an heir. Because you're, you're referring to me as father. I am the father. Your father. Our beloved father dwelling in the heavenly realms. May the glory of your name be the center on which our lives turn. We're going to stop right there. So the first letter in prayer, let me start like this. Okay, there's really there's four elements to making up that make up prayer. Four elements to make that make up prayer. I'm gonna give you the four. And when you put them all together, they spell out acts. So prayer is an act of reverence to God and when you pray and display that act of reverence to him he will act on your behalf so it spells acts and the four elements are adoration confession thanksgiving and supplication Adoration, confession, thanksgiving, and supplication. Let's go back to the first one. Adoration. It says, pray like this. Our beloved Father dwelling in the heavenly realms, may the glory of your name be the center on which our lives turn. Adoration creates the atmosphere and sets your posture so that you are simply focused on him and nothing else. Adoration is basically another word for worship. When you're adoring him, you're, you're, you're telling him about himself. That's what it says, our beloved father. 
You know, you are the center of my life. You're excellent. You're worthy. You're magnificent. You're beautiful. You're perfect. You're telling him about himself. You're bragging on God to God. That is what adoration is in a nutshell. You're bragging on God to God. It's not about nothing else. It's about him. Adoration or worship must encompass and saturate your prayers. Adoration must encompass, which means it must surround the whole thing and saturate your prayers. Saturate. It must be in every crack, every crevice of your prayers. Adoration must be all in your prayers. Your tone, you can just, as you're praying and speaking to God, your tone should be a tone of adoration. And that's why also why you must examine your heart and, and see what your motives are behind your prayers. Because when you have pure motives, you're able to simply focus on Him because you're not worried about yourself, you're not worried about whatever else is going on. But when you go into prayer, with the thought that hey, I'm going to pray because I need this or I need God to do this or this or whatever the case may be, then you have motives. You have a reason behind your prayer, which is not simply to to just go before the, the Father and commune with Him and strengthen your intimacy because that's really what prayer is. It's, it's, it's communing and, and being intimate with God, strengthening that relationship with God, strengthening that Prayer is, you can think of it like this, prayer is pillow talk with God. So, adoration must encompass and be all in and throughout your prayer. Right? The next element is C. C is for confession. C is for confession. So what is confession? You a confession is a statement made by one person telling a fact. And in this case, confession, another word for confession can be repentance. Because in this case, your confession is you're confessing your sins. Repenting of your sins. Asking him who is faithful and just to forgive you of all your sins and cleanse you of unrighteousness. Confession, verse 12 it says, forgive us of the wrongs we have done as we ourselves release forgiveness to those who have wronged us. Notice it doesn't say, Jesus didn't say, forgive us of our wrongs as we release forgiveness to those who ask for forgiveness. It never says that. It simply says, forgive us. As we, re as we ourselves release forgiveness to those who have wronged against us. So we need to stop waiting for people to apologize and ask for forgiveness and just release forgiveness to them. Because as long as you harbor unforgiveness, your heart can never be pure. You can never come from a place of purity if you won't release forgiveness to others. It's like this unforgiveness is a stain. And, and as long as you harbor that unforgiveness, you're going before God stained. You're going before God clean. And I'm not saying that, you know, you have to go before God just all white and everything. No, no, no. You, you go before God with your stains and with your sins and everything. You ask for forgiveness, but I'm saying that you need to release forgiveness before you can really purely go before the Father and ask for forgiveness. How can you have confidence that he's going to forgive you if you won't forgive? 
your brother, your neighbor. Just like the scripture says, you know, how can you love the father who you've never seen and not love your brother who you see every day? How can you have confidence that the father will forgive you and you've never seen him? But, you know, you can't forgive your neighbor who you who you see every day. So release forgiveness to those who have not asked for forgiveness. Watch this. Watch this. Your confession, write this down. Your confession restricts condemnation. Your confession restricts condemnation. As you confess and you, you're releasing your wrongdoings and you're asking for forgiveness and you're repenting to the Father, it, it basically closes the door on the enemy. And it, it restricts and prevents the enemy from, from coming in with guilt, coming in with condemnation. Coming in with shame. Confession actually is, is it releases a weight. It's, it's getting something off your chest. You know, when you go and you confess something, ah, I got that off my chest. That's that's all confession is. That's all that is. That's all forgiving us of the wrongs that we do as we release forgiveness to others. It's getting everything off your chest. It's laying laying it at his feet and letting it go because a lot of times we'll confess but we won't let it go we won't leave it we won't leave it there we'll we'll hold on to it and as we're holding on to it 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 leaves the door open for for the enemy to bring in condemnation i truly believe that when we confess but hold on to to our past we're, we're literally straddling in the doorway it's like oh i i, I kind of believe that he'll forgive me but then again i i you know i'm still ashamed of what i've done i still i still think about i still remember what what i've done But remember this, guilt cannot exist where the Holy Spirit is. I'm going to say that again. Guilt cannot exist where the Holy Spirit is. So if you truly believe that and you have accepted the Holy Spirit and he's coming to your heart and he's dwell with you as you dwell with him, guilt cannot be a part of your life. Shame cannot be a part of your life. Now, therefore, there is no condemnation to them that are in Christ Jesus. When you believe in your heart and confess with your mouth, condemnation must go. When you confess with your mouth, both that God raised Jesus from the dead, and then you also confess in your sins, there is no more, there is no more condemnation. And and watch this, I believe that also you start confessing your sins, but then you also need to stop confessing things over your life. Um, stop confessing labels over you. I've said it before. There is a difference between a sinner and one who has sinned. A sinner is a lifestyle. A sinner is someone who, who missed the mark, who messed up. But you got back up and you continue to press towards the mark. A sinner is someone whose life is filled with condemnation. But one who sinned, the reason they are able to get up is because they are not 
holding on to the condemnation, to the guilt of the fall. They understand that they fell. But they got back up. So confession, confession, I believe is very important in the life of, of, of the believer. When you when you don't conf when you don't take advantage of the confession part of prayer, you restrict and you prevent yourself from being able to not only release forgiveness to others but also to release grace and mercy to others. Because your inability to confess, you show that you don't believe that. God is able to extend mercy to you. So therefore, you can't extend mercy to anybody else. So confess. So we have adoration. We have confession. The third element is thanksgiving. Thanksgiving. Thanksgiving shows an acknowledgement and appreciation for what God has done, is doing, and what he shall do. Thanksgiving shows an acknowledgement and appreciation for what God has done. In verse 11, it says, We acknowledge you as our provider. You see, we acknowledge the acknowledgement as our provider, what he is doing. He is providing for them of all we need each day. The King James Version says, and give us this day our daily bread. Just, just the fact that, that we know that he will give us everything we need every single day. That thought right there should, should be able to, to hold off and keep away anxiety because we don't have to worry about tomorrow we don't have to worry about yesterday we could just focus on today knowing that as long as we're operating and walking in his will he will provide everything we need throughout the day you know for the children of Israel he was manna whenever they needed it fresh manna every day don't carry any over into the next day. I'll provide manna for you the next day. He was a fire by night. He will be everything that you need. He told Moses, I am. And you know, a lot of times we like to we like to put it all together. I am that I am. No, 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 no. It's I am. I am your provider. I am a way maker. I am a father to the fatherless. I am a mother to the mothers. I am whatever you need. And for that, we could be thankful. And then he says that I am. I am whatever your that is. In this case, it, it that that is, he is our provider. And for that, we should be thankful. But write this down. Your thanksgiving should never be dependent on God doing something for you. Your thanksgiving should never be dependent on God doing something for you. Think about it like this. If God pulled his hand back, you should never pull back your thanksgiving. If God pulled his hand back, if God stopped providing, you should not stop thanking him. That's why we say when we pray, you know, I thank you for everything that you've done, everything that you are doing. But if you never do another thing for me, I will still thank you. So our thanksgiving Yes, we're thanking him for what he has done, but it should not be dependent on that. 
we should be able to give thanksgiving before he does something. You know, we should be thankful giving him thanksgiving before the interview, before the job, before the house, before the car, before the relationship. We should live in we should live a life of thanksgiving. Cuz like we shouldn't wait till November to give thanks. We shouldn't wait till for Thanksgiving to to uh, express our thanks and how thankful we we are. We should be every day, all day. Our life should be simply full of thanks giving. Why? If for nothing else, you could simply give Thanksgiving just for the simple fact that He woke you up this morning. You know how the old saints, he woke me up this morning, he started me on my way. In my right mind, the activity of my limbs. Like that in itself is enough to be thankful for. You should be thankful for just for the fact that he provides for the birds of the air. Because if he provides for them, he'll definitely provide for you. Because you are a son. You are an heir to the throne. And the fourth element, the fourth element of prayer is supplication. Supplication. Supplication comes from the Latin verb supplicare, which means to plead humbly. To plead humbly. So basically, supplication is simply pleading with someone in power for help. If you look at verse 13, it says, Rescue us every time we face tribulation. And set us free from evil. Rescue us every time we face tribulation. They're pleading. Pleading with God. Rescue us. We need help. We're facing this storm. We need help to get us out of this storm. That is supplication. The scripture says, Paul said, Be anxious for nothing, but with prayer and supplication, with thanksgiving, make your request be made known to God. So prayer and supplication. Prayer is basically a petition and then you're supplicating. You're, you're giving your supplications to him as well. So supplication is pleading with God. I need you. I need you. And watch this. In order to give supplications to God, you must do away with pride. Yeah, in order to give supplications, you got to do away with pride. Why? Because you can't plead. And another word for pleading is begging. You can't plead, you can't beg when you're filled with pride. You can't you can't get on your knees and, and plead with someone when you're filled with pride, when you're puffed up. Why? Because you don't believe that you need help. And it literally says you're pleading with someone in power for help. But if you're filled with pride, then you feel that like, I don't need your help, I could do it myself. I got myself in this situation. I can get myself out. No. You got yourself in it, but you can't get yourself out. Thinking you can get yourself out is the reason that you're in it now. Pride. So we can't. We can't give our supplications to God if we're, if we're filled with pride. 
Not, not now, not ever. That's why, again, it goes back to it's important to examine yourself. Examine yourself before prayer. Make sure that your heart is, is, is clear. And, and that doesn't mean that you got to be perfect to go into prayer. I mean, you don't have to be perfect in the sense that the world looks at perfect, that the world defines perfect. No, you just got to go into prayer with pure motives and a clean heart. Right? And in order to obtain a clean heart, you have to you have to forgive. You can't be holding on to that dirt and that stain, them stains. You gotta forgive. You gotta let it go. You gotta shake off the guilt, shake off the shame. Be thankful that. Because when we're okay. When we're thankful, a lot of times we're thankful for. When we're thankful for what he's done, it's for what he's done materialistically. It's for the tangible things that we can touch in them, you know? But we should be thankful for the things that he's done that we can't see. Like, we should be thankful for the fact that he did forgive us and that he does and continues to forgive us. That, that right there is something that we should be thankful for. We should be thankful that goodness and mercy follow us all the days of our lives. We should be thankful that His mercies are new every morning. We got to be thankful for, for the, the small stuff in Christ. Because when we when we take those things for granted that's where condemnation comes in that's where pride comes in because when we when we aren't thankful that we that we receive new mercies every morning we then we think that oh yeah I woke up because of myself you know not knowing that it's because of his mercies that renewed at midnight and allowed me to wake up again the next morning. It's because of his mercies that I was able to wake up, not because of anything I could do with myself. So we need to begin to be thankful for the seen and the unseen. The tangible, the touchable, and the untangible. So the elements of prayer again are adoration, which is worshiping and bragging on God, confession, repentance, asking for forgiveness as we release forgiveness to others, thanksgiving, an acknowledgement and appreciation for everything that God has done, and supplication. And also, let me say this too, before we go. With and with and in supplication is petitions. It's making your requests be made known to God. Supplication, which is pleading and asking God who has the power for help. Father, I thank you for this time together. Help us be able to, to take advantage of the access that you have given us. Help us to be able to come to you with confidence. And it's in that confidence that we'll be able to give you all the adoration that you deserve. for being a God who is faithful and just to forgive us.
thank you for being a good, good father who, who gives good gifts to your children. I thank you for being a protector. As we leave this place, but never leave in your presence, I ask that you will cover us, that you will protect us, that you will keep us, keep us in your arms. Even now, I dispatch the protective and the ministering angels out to cover us, lead us, and guide us as we go through the week. Holy Spirit, do what you do. Comfort us, give us wisdom. So that we can navigate through this week so that we can navigate through everything that you that you place before us. Give us wisdom so that not only can we navigate through but so that we can so that we can see what it is that you would have us take from every situation that we may face. So that we can grow more into what it is that you see for us and in us so that we can grow more like you. Thank you and we give you all the praise, the glory, and the honor. In Jesus' name, amen. Examine yourself again. Any anything that you have in you that shouldn't be there, just take a moment and just ask God to remove it. Just take the bread. says and when he had taken the bread he took it broke it and he blessed it and he said take this eat of my body and as often as you do do this in remembrance of me let us eat together after he took the cup represents his blood, the blood that reaches to the highest mountain, the blood that will never lose its power. And he said, as often as you do this, do this in remembrance of me, let us drink together. And as often as you take up communion. You proclaim the Lord's death until he comes. <laughs> 